What I'm going to do just for these last few minutes is, is connect the environment with our humanity. It's not just an environmental problem. This climate change disaster is a human problem, and it's, it's killing people. <laughs> to put it bluntly, it's killing people, and that's why we need to do something about it. Just to give an example of how disconnected corporate thinking can be, um, this is a shop in India. When I, I was in India for a, a, a walk, a spiritual walk. It was slightly concerning uh, when I got, and I, I knew nothing about this thing apart from it was going to do me good. And uh, Ashton, my marketing manager, and my wife, Nicola, who sat at the back, said, oh, yes, it'll be good for you, Paul, to go on this walk along uh, the river Narmada in Gujarat, northwest India. Um, and on the walk, we there's a huge problem with sachets, plastic sachets, all over the place. I mean, there's plastic everywhere. In some parts, in the populated parts we were walking along the river, there is plastic waste absolutely everywhere. If you think it's bad here, 10 times worse there. Spend a lot of time in Africa, and it's just as bad there. But sachets in India are the main problem. And it's not because they do a lot of McDonald's there, or Kentucky Fried Chicken with sachets of tomato ketchup. No, that's not the reason there's so many sachets in India. It's because people can't buy a whole bottle of ketchup, for example. This next slide is, is mainly shampoo-type products. People can't afford to buy a bottle of shampoo. So a lot of stuff is sold in sachets. Now, that is an environmental disaster, but it's also a human disaster. It's not right, would you agree? People should be able to buy a bottle of ketchup everywhere in the world. They should be able to buy a bottle of shampoo rather than 25 sachets with the associated environmental challenge that represents. You know, I read an article uh, on Unilever. They are now doing something about the sachets and they're managing to to recycle five out of, of six, they say. But great, well done Unilever, and there are some B Corps within the Unilever world. But it's not the, it's, 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 it's scraping the, the ice off the windscreen, it's not dealing with the ice. There's a bigger problem here than this, just the environmental piece. Think back to Victorian England with uh, where this problem started in the Industrial Revolution, which I have to confess, if you, if you read the book, you'll know one of my ancestors is partly responsible for the Industrial Revolution starting. He invented something called the spinning jenny, which automated the weaving process and moved the clothes manufacturer away from spinning wheels to automated weaving. James Hargreaves, he was called, 17... 67, I think it was. That invention created the Industrial Revolution. Nothing wrong with that. But obviously it was how that then went on to create appalling work conditions and absolutely appalling pollution. And that's why, the, if, you, if you notice in the UK, um, who's from a city? Who's, who was kind of grew up in a city in the UK? Not that many of you, actually. What's, what's going on? Anyway... Um, this is true of most cities in, in, West, in the West, actually, not USA, Europe. Most cities have a poor area on the eastern side of the city. Just think back, think of cities that you know. Where do the poor people live? It's in the east. Why is that? Is it a strange coincidence? No. It's because the prevailing wind in that part of the world is from the west. So you, your factory owners, the middle class people, made sure they didn't live in the east. They lived in the west. All the pollution went to the east. Now, obviously, things have moved on from the Industrial Revolution, but because the poverty was there anyway, it's just regenerated poverty in, in these more recent generations. That's been the problem. Business people have made sure that the issues they've created haven't been 
their issues. They've made, made sure they're someone else's issues. The people that work in those factories, the people that do the menial jobs, that do the stuff no one else wants to do, guess where they live? They don't live in the West, they live in the East. And this has been the problem, thank God, things are changing. But the problem with business for the last 200 years is all the issues they've created, they've made sure they're not their problems, they're someone else's problems. Um, imagine the director of an electricity company living in that house. It, it's not going to happen. We don't really know the damage it causes people living under pylons, but you can be guaranteed no one who works at high up in that electricity company is going to live in that house because they probably know, they just haven't told us. So generally in the world, the problems we have created by this environmental disaster, they're not really going to affect us. Yes, they will. We might get hotter summers. We might have the odd drought. It's probably not going to kill us. The main exception to that possibly being the fires in California um, last year. The Guardian, this is in March 2014. Guardian headline, five years ago, just to emphasise. Climate change, the poor will suffer most. That's true. This disaster that we've propagated, it, it, it may have a minor effect on us in the West but it's going to have a far bigger effect on the poor people in poor parts of the world who are reliant on farming, who are reliant on consistent weather, who are reliant on stuff being the same as it, as it used to be, and it isn't. And, you know, just looking through various pictures I'm flicking up on the screen now, most of the disasters we hit, not all, but nine out of ten of the disasters we, we hear about are in those poor parts of the world. And it's not these people, primarily, it's not these people that are creating the problem. We've created a problem over the last 150, 200 years that other people are now suffering from. I've seen crops like this. Um, as some of you know, many of you have been to our fundraising ball in the summer. We were involved in a project in Western Kenya, and it's only better talking to people there. It's only been the last 10 years where they've just, their seasons have gone to pieces. They've either had huge flooding or massive droughts. We, we, I started a farm there. It's been a challenge because of the inconsistency in the weather. And this is down to climate change. Yes, there are scientists that will try and disprove it, probably for their own advantage. But this is real. This is killing people. When you rely on crops for your livelihood, this kills you. This road, this is the opposite extreme, same area, Bala, west of Kenya. This road, actually, several people in this room have driven along with me. Nicola, Robin, Ashton, all been out to the, the orphanage. This is the road between the orphanage and Kazuma, which is the, the third biggest city in, in Kenya. That was taken about a year ago after some flooding. Look at it. <laughs> it's like an earthquake. It's not. It's, it's, a it's a flooding situation. I mean, scary. For us to make real change, we need to engage our intuitive minds, our hearts, our souls, whatever you want to call it. We can't sort this by, by thinking. Because the drive to change comes from deeper within our, our brains than that. This picture is significant. Can't look at it too long. Oh, that's all. 
the same thing will happen as it did. I'm just about to tell you the story. I put this picture up at a Chamber of Commerce meeting in, in Worcestershire. And uh, it, it, it was in the early stages of, of, of writing my book. And um, I was just, I was trying out a few, a few ideas, really, on the, the audience. And um, I, I, I'm, I've always been passionate about people and helping people change their lives. The environmental piece for me was, was probably slightly more theoretical. Yes, I knew it was a good thing to do, but it hadn't, I hadn't um, been aff affected by the, the passion like some other people maybe. Anyway, I put this slide up on the, the screen <laughs> and broke down in tears, which the audience was about this kind of size. It was slightly embarrassing. It's been paid to be there and um, couldn't carry on with the talk. Uh, anyway, I managed to, to pull myself together. But that was the point for me that I then realised this environmental problem is a human problem. It's, ki it's killing people. Or, to put it more bluntly, we are killing people. We need to do something. The thing is, we are conditioned to making lives better for ourselves. That's the way we're brought up. The rich and powerful are, which is us, by the way, are conditioned to make our lives better and sold everyone else. Now, that's probably a bit extreme, but this is what we are brought up. This is how we are educated. Do, do yourself good. Charity begins at home. All that's crap, if we're going to use that word. Ashton's used it already, so I can. <laughs> Not as bad as the one Mark used earlier. <laughs> this is our upbringing. We are conditioned to be basically looking out for number one. Times need to change. We need to change. You see, there is an innate sense of fairness within us. There is an innate sense of wanting justice in the world. But sometimes it's been, it's been kind of bred out of us almost. But actually, deep down within, for most of us, it's still there. Yeah, pressure's come, shit happens. Oh, just used it. And that compassion that is within all people disappears, gets washed away, becomes too difficult. But we need to change. And if we're going to change the world, it has to start with us. And we have to change ourselves. It's not our problem. Well, actually, it is now. It is our problem, so I think pretty obvious from what we've heard today, we know it's our problem. And we need to reverse the injustice that's in the world. There's too much of it. Generally, we don't like it. Pol politics has failed. That's become very obvious over the last few months. Politics has failed. It's, who said that earlier? Politics ain't going to change this. We're going to change it. Businesses are going to change it. And maybe then the legislation might follow. But don't wait for the legislation to force you to buy an electric car, for example. Let's change it first ourselves. It's time to bring the heart back into business. And to, if that's not there in your business, I think it is for many of you, but let's, let's grow the heart. Let's make it a, a bigger heart. Are we ready to do that? Hopefully. Well, I know some of you are, because I had some good conversations at lunchtime. <laughs> We've heard um, some stuff about legacy earlier. That video was powerful, wasn't it? that Mark showed earlier. Um, and this has come up three times. I didn't, I didn't know this was going to come up. But the question is, how are we going to be remembered? How are we going to be remembered? I put up, a, I was doing a presentation at IFE, I think it was. And uh, what I had a, 
it's slightly, slightly um, I didn't use it today, but it was actually, I put up a picture of my own tombstone, um, just as an illustration. It's an exercise that is worth doing, is to, to imagine yourself at your own funeral, looking back at your life. What did um, someone call it earlier, actually? Uh, nursing, the nursing home task. Someone mentioned earlier. It's a similar thing. How are we going to be remembered? People get remembered not through looking after themselves, not from looking, making number one, you know, amassing loads of riches. They're not really the people get rem remembered for too long anyway. If you look back at the last 150 years or so, who are the people that have been remembered? who are remembered most. It's generally those that have done something for other people, that have laid their lives down. Florence Nightingale. She wasn't in it for herself. Gandhi. Nor was he. Nelson Mandela. Just read his autobiography again. Thoroughly recommend it. He wasn't really in it for himself, was it? Was he? He was, he was wanting change. And for his trouble, he got banged up in prison for 27 years. He'll be remembered for a long time. As will Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King, who gave his life for his cause. They're the kind of people that get remembered. So how do, <coughs> how do we want to be remembered? in our businesses, in our families, in our communities. How are we going to be remembered? This is a small thing we've been talking about today, but it can make a, a big difference. I'm just going to finish by reading something from... Has anyone read um, Simon Sinek's book, Leaders Eat Last? written by the same guy that, that wrote Start With Why, which a lot of you probably have read. He talks about leadership in here, and some of the inspiration for my couple of chapters in my book on, on leadership came from, came from this book. I'm just, it's a bit like a poem, this. I'm going to read this to finish, and then I'm going to just be have a couple of minutes silence for you to reflect on not just what I've said, but what we've heard all day. And maybe that's the time to think of how we can put others first and how we can make a difference. So I'll read this out and then we'll just have a few moments of silence. Leaders, and I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you are leaders, yes. You, you, you may not be the leader of your business, but you are leaders. If you're here today, you're wanting change, you're a leader. Leaders are the ones who run headfirst into the unknown. They rush toward the danger. They put their own interests aside to protect us or to pull us into the future. Leaders would sooner sacrifice what is theirs to save what is ours. And they would never sacrifice what is ours to save what is theirs. This is what it means to be a leader. It means that they choose to go first into danger, head first towards the unknown. And when we feel sure they will keep us safe, we will march behind them and work tirelessly to see their visions come to life and proudly call ourselves their followers. I want to be like that. And I hope you do too. Let's just have a few moments of silence to reflect. <coughs> <coughs> 